The right side of his face was up. I could see his eyes were fixed. There was a hole in the skull. I could see in that hole there was no brain matter left. It had all been blown out. We were very concerned about it, but we knew we didn't have much of a choice. In this particular instance, going into Texas, the reason for the trip was maximum visibility and maximum exposure for President and Mrs. Kennedy because they wanted as many people to be up close and personal to them as they possibly could get. And so that was the purpose of the trip. And that meant open cars no matter where we went. They asked, the agents were instructed to, to back off as much as possible. Uh, there were times when I got up very, very close, but it was because of the situation that developed. But uh, under normal circumstances, we tried to stay as far away as we, as we could to make them uh, feel like the, that they were just among their, their friends and people along the side of the street and uh, wanted the people inside the street to feel like there was no barrier between them and the President and Mrs. Kennedy. So it was the president and his wife and Governor Connolly and his wife in that, in that car. How, where were you and how far away? That was the presidential car. I was in the immediate car behind him, the follow-up car, which we ran between about three to five feet between the two cars at all times, no matter what the speed. Uh, I was on the left-hand side of the running board of that car. That was also an open car. There were eight agents in that car and two members of President Kennedy's staff, Kenny O'Donnell, his chief of staff, and Dave Powers, his chief personal assistant. Uh, I was on the left side of the car on the running board, and as we went through an area called Dealey Plaza, I was scanning the area. It was just a grassy area, and the crowd, which had been very large as we traveled through Dallas, had dropped off as we approached Dealey Plaza. It was, the end of the motorcade, pretty much, we were going to get on an expressway to take the president to a speech site called the Trade Mart. And there was an overpass we were going to have to go under, and I was looking at that, and I noticed there was some police on top, and that was good enough for me. And we noticed, though, as we traveled down the streets of Dallas, that the windows were open on buildings, and people were on fire escapes, on top of buildings, any place they could be to get a better view of the motorcade. And the same was true of the building we passed on the corner of Houston and Elm Street. It was called the Texas School Book Depository. We saw that there were about four or five windows open in that building. And there were some workmen sitting on a ledge, apparently having lunch, taking a lunch break, watching the motorcade as we approached. And we had turned down on Elm Street, oh, maybe 150 feet. And as I was scanning to my left, I heard this explosive noise from the rear over my right shoulder. Now, I didn't recognize it as a gunshot initially, so I started to turn toward that noise, and my, I only got as far as the back of the president's car because I saw the president's reaction, and that's when I realized it had been a gunshot. He grabbed at his throat, and he started to fall to his left. He had a back brace on, which prevented him from really bending much forward, but also immediately in front of him was seated Governor Connolly in a jump seat, and the back of that jump seat was almost up against the knees of President Kennedy. So he started to fall to his left, and when I then realized this was a gunshot, so I jumped from my position and I ran toward the presidential car with the intent of getting up on top of the back to, prevent, to uh, provide a shield there for President and Mrs. Kennedy. Now, when I ran, I had to go between a motorcycle officer on his motorcycle and the car I was on. There was engine noise, and they told me later there was a second shot that, at that time, but I never heard that shot. And as I approached the car, just as I was getting there, there was another shot that was fired. That one I heard and I felt because at that time the president had fallen a little bit farther to his left, and his head was way down, like, kind of like this. And that sh shot hit him in the back of the head, and then it erupted out of the upper right quadrant, just above the ear. And it blew that portion of the skull, skull, which was still attached to the scalp, forward like a flap, kind of. And out of that wound gushed blood and bone fragments and brain matter 
all over the back of the car, all over me, all over Mrs. Kennedy. When I started to get up in the car, Mrs. Kennedy came up in the trunk. She was trying to grab some of that material that had erupted out of the president's head, and she managed to get some of it in her hand. I grabbed her and put her in the back seat. When I did that, the president's body fell to his lap, into her lap. The right side of his face was up. I could see his eyes were fixed. There was a hole in the skull. I could see in that hole there was no brain matter left. It had all been blown out. I assumed it, you know, he had passed. He was, he was dead. So I turned and gave him a thumbs down to the other agents on the car behind because they hadn't had a chance to react like I did because they turned toward the noise too for guys on the other side of the car, which meant they turned away from the president just at the moment that he was be going to be shot. By the time they turned back, I was already at the car. It was too late for them. They couldn't do anything. What, what was your immediate reaction then? And was it you that gave the order to go to the hospital? Well, I screamed at the driver to get to the hospital, but the, the agent in the right front seat, he also, he told the driver to hit it, get out of there, because that was what they were supposed to, we were supposed to evacuate the area. And so, the, you know, we were, we were not familiar with the Dallas at all. And so the chief of police, Chief Curry, got in front of us in his car, and he led us to Parkland Hospital. How long of a drive is that? Well, uh, it took us about four minutes to get there, and we were running above 70 miles an hour as we traveled down this Stemmons Freeway. And I was lying up on back of the top seat, of the back seat. Uh, I wedged, kind of wedged myself in between the two sides of the car by hooking my leg on the right side and holding on with my hands on the left side so I wouldn't slide off because we had to make some turns and it was a little precarious at a couple of points. What's, what's happening in the car at this time? What are the other people doing? Nobody is saying anything. At first, Mrs. Kennedy made some comments. She said, uh, oh, Jack, what have they done? They've shot his head off. I have his brains in my hand. I love you, Jack. And that was all she said. And then we raced to the hospital. When we got to the hospital, they, they had been alerted that we were coming by the chief of police. But there was nobody there outside to meet us at all. So. The agent in the lead car jumped out, ran in. He found that there was a tenant trying to bring out two gurneys at the same time. They got caught in the doorway and couldn't do it. So he grabbed one of the gurneys and brought it out. And then the tenant brought the other one out. But we had to remove the governor from the car before we could do anything for the president because of the way the car was configured. So we got the governor up and put him on a gurney and they rushed him into the emergency room. Uh, then we were going to work and help the president get out, just take the president, put him on a gurney. But Mrs. Kennedy had a hold of him, and she wouldn't let go. So I pleaded with her. I said, please, Mrs. Kennedy, let us help the president. And never got no response at all. And then I did said that again, and I still didn't get any response. And then I thought to myself, I know what's wrong. I've been with her over three years now. I know her pretty well. She didn't want anybody to see the condition he's in because it was horrible. And so I took off my suit coat and I covered up his head and his upper back. As soon as I did that, she let go. We lifted him up, put him on a gurney, ran into the emergency room, put him in trauma room one. And then you waited with her? Yeah, I waited in there. My assistant stayed immediately beside her. My supervisor asked me to open a phone line to the White House in Washington. So I asked the uh, emergency room personnel to use one of their phones. They gave me a phone to use. Uh, we had a White House switchboard in Dallas that the White House Communications set up. Uh, I got a hold of that switchboard and told them to connect me to the White House and keep the line open. And so I was briefing my supervisor in Washington about what had happened, and the operator cut in. And he said, uh, Mr. Hill, the Attorney General wants to talk to you. So the Attorney General was Robert Kennedy, the President's brother. He said, Clint, he said, what's going on down there? So I explained to him that there had been a shooting. The president was, he had been hit. The Governor Connolly had been hit. We were in the hospital. They were doing what they could to try and uh, help the two gentlemen. He said, well, how bad is it? Now, I didn't want to tell Robert Kennedy that his brother was dead. So I just said, it's as bad as it can get. And with that, he just hung up the phone. So then at 1 o'clock, the doctor came out of the uh, trauma room and said, uh, I'm sorry, but the president is dead. There's nothing more we can do. 
when that happened, the chief of staff came to me and said, uh, Clint, we want to transport the president's body back to Washington. Can you arrange to get us a casket? So I got a hold of the administrator of the hospital and they put me in touch with a mortuary, ordered a casket and had it brought to the hospital, brought in, and they were preparing the president's body to be placed in the casket when uh, one of the coroners came in. And he said, what are you guys doing? And we said, we're preparing to transport the body back to Washington. He said, you can't leave with the hospital. We said, why not? He said, because there's a law in Texas that says that a homicide victim has to be autopsy before he's released. And we said, well, how long will that take? And they said, oh, an hour, maybe two hours, maybe a day. And we said, no, that's not acceptable. So then they agreed to allow us to take the president's body, provided we would uh, provide a uh, medical doctor with the body through the entire process. And so I volunteered Admiral George Berkeley, who was the president's military physician and happened to be there. And so he uh, remained with the body uh, right up through the autopsy. What, I mean, the, the shooting was about 12.30 Dallas time. Well, it's roughly 12.30 in the afternoon. So he really, the trauma physicians really only had a few minutes before they realized there was nothing they could do. They realized almost instantly that nothing they could do. They didn't even turn the president's body over. They only looked at him from the front. They didn't realize that there were two uh, gunshot holes in the back. One at about the neck level, that, that was the entrance point and it exited where the neck tie is, uh, the knot, and uh, it had nicked the knot. And the other one, uh, low in the back of the head, that it exited above the ear. The one above the ear is the one that they saw immediately. No brain matter there. His eyes was fixed. There was no, he, he was breathing a little bit at the time that we got him into the emergency room. I guess it was just an involuntary um, situation, but uh, that didn't last long and there was no blood pressure and nothing. Did you accompany Mrs. Kennedy on the flight back? Yes, I did. I, when we got the permission to remove the body and took the casket out to the, the ambulance that we had there, uh, Edward Berkeley got in the back of the ambulance with the casket. I suggested to Mrs. Kennedy that we ride in the car, and she said, no, I'm going to ride in the back with the president. I said, okay. So I opened the door, and she got in, and I got in with her. And so there we were, three of us, in the, with the casket in the back of the hearse, all the way to Love Field. And we got to Love Field, and then the agents that I was working with, we all carried the casket up the stairs to the rear door of Air Force One. And we got to the rear door, we found that the casket was a little bit too wide with the handles on it to get through the door. So we had to tear the handles off in order to get it in the Air Force One. The, the chief engineers uh, for the Air Force uh, One had had all the seats removed in a certain portion of the back of the aircraft so we could place the casket topside and not have to go into the belly of the plane. And uh, we then uh, prepared to leave, but uh, Vice President and Mrs. Johnson were also on board. And uh, he had been conferring with Washington and had received instructions that he should get, be sworn in while we were still on the ground in Dallas. And that required a federal judge. So we finally found Sarah Hughes, who had just been appointed a federal judge, brought her on board and she was going to uh, swear the, the then vice president in to be president. And just before that happened, I was in the forward portion of Air Force One, Mrs. Kennedy was back by the casket, and she sent word that she wanted to see me. So I went back through the presidential, where the presidential part was and where she was, and she stood up and she grabbed my hand and she said, oh, Mr. Hill, she said, well, what's gonna happen to you now? I said, I'll be okay, Mrs. Kennedy, I'll be okay. She was concerned about myself and about the other agents, about how we were reacting because she knew how much we thought of the president. So then when that was over, they uh, began the swearing-in ceremony and she agreed to stand right next to Vice President Johnson as he took the oath of office for President of the United States. Still wearing the same clothes? That she wouldn't take off her clothes. She said she wanted the people to see what had been done. 
It's amazing te testimony that she would be concerned about you at that moment. I know, it was shocking to me that she would be. Obviously, the next few days would create even more uh, upheaval with the murder of Oswald and the in incredible funeral for the president, I believe, the, the day following that. Well, the, the, we had a number of days. The day after, the, uh, we brought the casket to the White House, and it lay there in the White House through the 24th until the, to, through the 23rd until the 24th, and then we had to remove, move it to the U.S. Capitol, place it in state there on the 24th. And uh, there were so many people who wanted to see it that they had to allow people to pass by it all day and all night that night. And then we went back on the 25th, Monday, and that was the day of the official funeral. Brought the body out of the rotunda of the Capitol, put on the cortege, and went back to the White House. And we got to the White House, we met uh, about 110 or so visiting heads of state, heads of government like Charles de Gaulle and Haile Selassie, King Baudouin of Belgium, the Queen of uh, the Netherlands, and I mean, there were just so many heads of state there. And then Mrs. Kennedy decided to walk from that point to St. Matthew's Cathedral. And because she walked, all these heads of state walked, which created an absolute security nightmare for everybody as we walked up Pennsylvania Avenue to St. Matthew's Cathedral. Um, was Mrs. Kennedy aware? Did she have any reaction to the murder of Oswald at the time? She didn't find out about it because of what ha how it happened. It happened on the 24th, just about the time we were taking the body out of the White House to put it under cortege to take it to the Capitol. So I don't, she didn't know about it until at least later that day. But insofar as I never heard any reaction from her whatsoever. Did she, well, let me ask you this question first. Do you think if Oswald hadn't been murdered that the conspiracies would not have arisen in the way that they did? Oh, I, that, that's the case. The fact that he was murdered, the fact that we could not interrogate him and find out his motive and exactly why he did this, has created all the uh, room for conspiracies of all kinds. And there's a new one every day. And I hear them all. And uh, the, the one thing about it is they all are theories. They're not fact at all.